Rob Dew here with InfoWars.com, and we are standing uh, just south of downtown Austin, Texas. And uh, we've had Dr. Nick Begich, who came to visit the studio the last few days. And last night we had uh, a dinner with him, myself, Alex, and, uh, and our wives, and it was very interesting. We got into a lot of subjects, and we almost broke out the camera and started doing a Facebook mentions. And at the time, it was, it was kind of a crowded restaurant, and, as, and I pulled out a, a big light and sh started shining it everywhere. And Alex was like, no, 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 we'll just do it tomorrow, do it tomorrow. So he said, go outside, find a nice place outside. We were looking at Zilker Park. Uh, there was, you know, an event going on there. So we're here, and uh, this is Butler Park. Let's take a little pan around. Nice little green space just south of downtown. Um, so we're kind of here opening things up. This is going to be a pretty relaxed Facebook mentions. Um, it's not going to be as, um, as you know, as intense as Alex likes to get. But we're going to talk about some really interesting stuff. I got Dr. Nick Begich right here, actually. Here he is. And... Um, so, Dr. Nick, where, like last night we started talking about, and we almost started doing the Facebook mentions, talking about looking into someone's soul. And, and so, uh, I guess we have superficial looks, and then you have these intense gazes. So, well, I guess let's start there. We'll start, use that as a jumping point and see where this conversation takes us. And we have plenty of time. There's people out there watching. What, what's the numbers up right now? So, so about 700 people are watching. This is going to grow throughout the, uh, you know, the 30 or so minutes that we're talking. But uh, let's just start with that. Like, what is the key to making that connection, that human connection that we are, that we seem to be lacking in this modern world? Well, you know, uh, it's something I discovered at a, at a really um, late age, at 52, actually. And I, I thought every, everybody did it. And when I look in someone's eyes, I see a human soul. I don't see a, a physical form. I don't see your body. I mean, of course, I see it physically standing in front of me. But when I actually look into a person's eyes, I perceive them. I, I connect with them. And, and I thought everybody did this. I mean, I, this is kind of the way I've always lived. And what I discovered at 52, six years ago, is that, in fact, most people don't ever, ever see that. And for me, that was a really serious uh, trans, transformative moment in the sense that how can a person live? in this world without having the ability to recognize another living being, another living soul. And, and it was upsetting. I mean, it was really upsetting to me. Uh, still, a lot of emotion comes with that, with that thought because to connect with people, to recognize the God in each person is, is through the eyes, actually. And, and this is why in, personal connection by being next to someone, by being in someone's presence is so much more relevant than the kind of interfaces that people use today, the electronic interface. And, and what I thought was normal for most people, I found out was kind of the exception. Mm -hmm. But this is the root um, of communication, when you connect with someone on that level. And I mean, when we were talking last night, you know, we kind of went through a bunch of different things and it sort of ended um, in this in this discussion about this kind of recognition of what we really are and when you think about what we really are I mean we, we have a body of uh, what I call my carrier <laughs> which is the way I re look at it mm -hmm. every cell in my body is replaced about every seven years which means seven years ago I was a completely different physical form but I'm not changed I'm, I'm evolving all the time I'm experiencing things all the time but in in the 58 years now that I've lived, you know, my body has totally been replaced eight times, going into time number nine. But I'm still the same human being. In fact, when I look back to my earliest memories as a child, I remember looking in a mirror and seeing this body and going, I'm really frustrated because I got this small body. I don't have a lot of experience. But when I look back on that, that moment, I'm no different than I was then. I just have a lifetime of experiences hanging on this frame. But those experiences, they don't define me. They don't describe me completely. In fact, last night we were talking about sort of the good news in life and the bad news in life and how it hits us. And those are the opportunities, you know, because in one week, for instance, I had the worst situation aside from my father's disappearance happening. And then in the same week, the absolute best thing that had ever happened to me. And in that moment of recognition, I realized that neither the greatest things in life or the worst in life define who we are. But we are behind that. We are behind our experiences, observing those experiences, 
but they are not us. We are so much more than that. Well, I think, I mean, really, I think starting with television, you know, when you start to think about how people began to spend their time, mm -hmm. um, even going back to radio, I mean, radio was kind of a restricted thing. You listened to it in the background. Well, you had to come up with the images in your mind. So right. You so you're active, your you active. Just, exactly. And it was a family event. You sat around, listened to the radio, but you discussed what was going on. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of an opportunity to sort of open a, an audio newspaper, if you will. Um, then we moved to television, which became more of a feed situation. And in fact, they even call it programming because essentially that's what it is. You're in front of the TV receiving the information in a state of, of super relaxed awareness. In fact, if you think about it, when you're watching television, most people come home very tired at the end of the day and they're watching the news feed and their wife or their husband is saying, hey, dinner's ready, dinner's ready. And they don't even yeah, hear them. Sure. Right. And the reason they don't hear them is they're actually in an uh, in-between state. It's a theta uh, alpha state where the brain is quite relaxed, you're attentive and aware, and it's almost a state of um, light trance, where that data that's coming in is being imprinted on you, in you in a way that is really anchoring. That's why advertising is so effective. That's why the population has begun the culture shapes based on what the, what the data feed is. And so you look at culture, it's a total reflection of television and media. And it's an illusion, quite frankly. And that illusion sort of takes us further and further away from our humanity, our ability to connect with people. I think that's sort of where it begins. And now, virtually all of our world is situated in the same way. So that our interfaces with people are filtered through an electronic medium. This is a, a huge mistake. It, it's absolutely critical for people to connect with each other, physically connect, be in the presence of each other. It's why I came uh, to Austin this week. I, I, I had heard and I felt in my heart that my friend Alex Jones was going through some tough times. And that's when people need to arrive. That's when you need to show up. That's when you need to stop what you're doing and get on the plane and go see someone and encourage them in the, in the fight that we're all in together. And to recognize that the fight is not the finish line that's relevant. It's how we carry ourselves, how we, how we walk through each day. The final decisions aren't ever going to be ours individually. They're going to be ours collectively. What is our job? To inspire, to awaken within ourselves our own internal revolution, and then to help others awaken that revolution. And that's where we were in that discussion last night that really got exciting, because the idea is that we can do this. Individually, that's where the revolution starts. We can help awaken each other by recognizing what we are and looking at the circumstances in life very, very differently. One thing that you asked about, what, what's the big shift? It's about paying attention. It's about paying attention to the fine things. Being well. conscious. Being consciously aware. Sitting here having this conversation, I'm still aware of the wind. I feel the energy in my hands. Mm -hmm. I see the sun in my face. The sky is still blue. I see the people around me, but I'm still engaged in this conversation by I am paying attention. My awareness is not lost in my words and lost in my emotion. It's pushing them out. It's moving them out. This is a very, very different way of viewing the world. Instead of just talking and thinking and feeling, you're paying attention to what you're thinking. And you're, you are the awareness behind those thoughts. This is fundamentally why when I look in someone's eyes, I recognize that awareness behind their form. I see them as a living soul. I connect with them as a living soul. I exchange energy with them as a living soul. And when we're together, we feel it, we know it, we can sense it. And that's what triggers that internal spark in another because you're transferring compassion, empathy, love, consideration in that interaction. That's what alivens people. That's what triggers that change in people is a recognition that you're not alone, that you are connected, that we're all connected. Fundamentally, we are created in the image of a creator all of us. It's not how we look, it's the energy that we are. As a young, one of my areas of science I first got interested was gemology and minerals. And, and in that there's a sub, sub area, crystallography. And a crystal is the outward expression of its internal arrangement with, of atoms. And we can think of our body in the same way, or you can drop a level deeper, and those atoms are the outward expression of energy. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what we are. In fact, most of us, we, we, we touch each other, we feel form, but this form is mainly empty space. It's, it's how the mind interacts 
with the world around us. And we see just one very narrow bandwidth. What the physics tells us today is we are so much more than what we perceive. What we perceive is a grain of sand on the beach of what our life truly is. And yet we think this is who we are, this body. We are so much more than that. And, and I think this is, again, when we begin to realize that, when we begin to claim back our birthright of what we are as created human beings, that's when the change can happen. The revolutions are not external. Those don't last. Those are cultural, social, economic revolutions. The spiritual revolution is the revolution that changes the world. And whenever we've seen that emerge on the planet, huge changes take place. That is the stage, the point at which we are at this moment. This is the moment. This is the time to act on what we each believe to be right and true, to step into what I, what I recognize as faith. It's not some big mysterious thing. It's simple. It's recognizing what's right and true in your heart, feeling it there, and then acting on it, stepping into it with an action. The next one reveals itself. You don't need a grand big plan. You just need the next step, the one you believe in, the one you absolutely know you can achieve. That's faith, is knowing it and acting on it. We can each do that. Last night we were talking, Alex and I, at the very end. And, you know, when you're in this kind of work, you really feel like you just got to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And if you're not pushing to your absolute 110%, you actually feel guilty about it. Yeah. And, and all of us in leadership have gone through that. And I can say this about that. We don't need to feel guilty. We're not meant to run at 110% all the time. But we're meant to try to make an effort. That's it. That's the only requirement. It's not about winning. It's not about losing. It's about doing, trying. And, and um, I, I, I know a, a number of people that are pretty remarkable. And they walk into a room, and the presence of them being in that room alters the, the, the whole complexion. The, the idea of energy exchanges between people is so fundamental to this. Um, I've had some pretty interesting experiences. I won't get into those today, but, but what it's anchored in me is what the physics also anchors in me, which is these things that we think are so mysterious, we're not created randomly. They follow laws and order and structure that man is gradually discovering. And even the physics tells us now that we are so much more. There's, we are a multidimensional created being that has huge capacity and our job is to remember, to remember who we are and what we are. You know, last night um, in the conversation, you know, the questions kind of come up, you know, how do you engage in all this work? You know, I mean, there's, there's all the tension in the world and the fear in the world and the anger and the hatred and all those, those really heavy emotions that you can get sucked into so easily. And how do you maintain it? You know, because I maintain a pretty good sense of happiness and joy 99% of the time. You have a smile on your face most of the most time. Most of the time, even talking about some of the toughest topics. And this is why, because I know we win. I absolutely know we win. And, and there's no doubt in my mind about that. And fearlessness comes with that, that knowing, that understanding. And at the same time, I recognize that each of the very difficult times in my life, starting with the disappearance of my dad, and, and I want to talk about that a little bit. My dad was flying on a plane as a United States congressman and disappeared off the face of the earth. Biggest search in the history of the United States, didn't ever found a trace. Now, I was 14 years old at the time, and I was a pretty radical 14-year-old, pretty uncontrollable, quite frankly, and it's because I just had way too much uh, energy and way too much personal drive that was not being well directed. Now, when my father disappeared, it's like a missing an action situation. You don't know. There's never a certainty about this. Now, what I observed in that, of course, my own emotions as a 14-year-old, um, but the event, people say, well, that was the most horrible event that probably happened in your life. And, and in fact, on one level it was, but it was also the most transforming event, the most important event, the most positive event in my life. Now. People have a hard time with that. Well, how can the disappearance, death of your dad be so positive? Because it changed me. What he couldn't do when he was alive, in his passing, he did instantly. I gave up childhood at that moment in my own mind. I did it consciously. Now, and I did it, and it was as simple as a choice. As simple as a choice. I went from a C student to a 4.0 student. Boom! That quickly, that rapidly. I went from detached and narcissistic to empathetic and compassionate because I made a choice to change. It is simple as that. Now, in that circumstance, what I also observed is my father's mother, my grandmother. 
and it totally devastated her. I mean, it, and, it ne and she never recovered from it. And, I, and, I, and arbitrarily, I said, you know, about 30% of the time when we face disaster, that's the result. But 70% of the time, we overcome. And that was kind of arbitrary as a 14-year-old. But this is what also I learned then. You can make the decision to learn the lesson in that instant, or you can stretch it out. You can stretch it out over your whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. And you can repeat the lesson even in certain cases over and over and over again until you come to the point where you say, okay, I can't control this circumstance. I cannot control the misery that I'm feeling right now, but I can recognize it. And this is one of the keys. One of the keys for transformation is when you're feeling those emotions, those strong emotions, don't just let yourself run with them. Hesitate for one second and pay attention to them. Notice them. You're feeling angry? Don't just be angry. See anger in you. Ex and allow your anger to rise, but notice it. And as you notice it, you immediately control it. You can like bear hug it almost. You can. And, and, and because you can recognize it, yes, it's an attribute of you. Yes, it's trying to take you to a place that you don't want to be, but your awareness of it gains control of it and you recognize it as not you, but a reflection of something going on in the experiences around you. But your choice about how you index this is the critical element. So from my perspective, starting at 14, when I had very, very difficult times, my goal was to come to the recognition of what was in that. What was in that for me to learn? Because in every situation of disaster, of bad news, of suffering, is the opportunity to grow. Those are the, usually the only opportunities that most people experience. Now you can experience this through the profound feelings of love. You can get those transforming um, uh, moments. In fact, you'll, you know, everybody knows somebody who fell in love and they just changed dramatically because that emotion moved them in a way. And if they paid attention to it as they were experiencing it, they moved with that in a very different way that forms union. This is why family is fundamental to most religious beliefs, because when you form union, when you become one with someone else, this is the typeset of what we're supposed to do with everyone, be one with every other living soul. This is our destiny as living human beings. And, and I think when you experience the hardships, and I, I could give you a list of them that most people go, oh my gosh, how did you overcome that? I overcame it by making a decision that these were not who I am. They are reflections, they are experiences that are made, um, as I say, in the fiery furnace of life. They're meant to refine us into the finery of gold that we truly are as living souls. So these experiences are not thrust upon us. I think they're co-created to provide us the opportunity to grow beyond what we can even imagine for ourselves. If people have asked me 20, 30 years ago, would I be doing this work? I would have said, no, I can't even see it but I could see the next step, and I took those next steps. And that's what every one of us uh, can truly do. <clears throat> we were talking last night about gazing, looking in people's eyes and seeing their soul. Two people in love, this is something easily accomplished. Two people in love <clears throat> sit down together, gaze into each other's eyes. Tell the people over here how to do this. This is really important, is, is sit with someone you love in a quiet place look each other in the eye and hold that gaze. And what happens is, within a few minutes, your heart rate synchronize. Your breathing synchronizes. Two actually flow into one energy field, where then the, the, the notion of two or more gathered together, it ampli the amplitude rises. You're beyond then the, uh, just the addition of two people. Resonance works like this. It's, its resonance is R plus R squared. In other words, it doubles up that energy. It makes more energy available. So gazing is a simple way to come into union with your spouse, to come into union with your children, to come into union with the people you love and care about. And it amplifies that love in a way that can be felt, physically felt in your body. That's when you know you've connected to God, to the Almighty when you can feel the energy flow through you. And this is possible for every living soul. This is our birthright. This is who we are. This helps us recognize and remember who we are. This brings out the potentials of who we are and the gifts of the Spirit that are innate in us, waiting to be released. Those are the things that will change the world. Those are the things that create the revolution within 
that create the evolution without, the changes without, the things that truly change the world. And this was why this was maybe the most important thing we covered this week, was the idea that we can actually take control of our lives in a way that is quite different and quite dramatic. Breathing as a simple thing, just bringing the air in through the nose and out through the mouth slowly. Five beats in, ten beats out. Do that three times. It'll drop your anxiety level. You can measure your heart rate, your breathing, any of the any of the stress tests you wanna you want to render, and just simple recognition and paying attention to your breathing, which kind of distracts you from your thinking long enough for your system to relax. There are simple things that we can do that can enhance our performance as human beings. But more importantly, connecting with each other is the beginning of the evolution. We need to reconnect, set the TVs aside, set the cell phones down, take time each day to connect with the creation around you and the people around you. You know, and we talk too about what's important in life and everyone attaches so much to things, to what we own, what we possess, how many cars we have. And every single person, I've had 42 friends and relatives in the last 15 die. Now, though each of those events obviously have an emotional impact on me, but more importantly, each of those 42 souls still live through me. They live through me in the sense that I still carry the stories, the messages, the memories of them, and they're projected in everything I do. I, I discovered love with a woman um, that I was with for the last six years. That love, that foundational love that I discovered is now part of everything I do. It's the foundation of what I do. God is love, and when we connect with that, we connect with God again. This is why relationships are so important, why being together is so important. And you know, when I, when I think about the obstacles, fear, worry, these are the things that get in the way. These are the things that actually stop you from reaching higher states of consciousness. That's why when the angels come, the first thing they utter is, fear not. Why is that? Because as soon as you run into fear, the possibilities, you go into a fight or fight response, the possibilities of intellectually, emotionally, and on an aware level, a conscious level, connecting, evaporate. That's why the media always throws fear, anger, hatred our way because that's what they want to trigger in you. That's what they want to take from you because in taking that and, and allowing yourself to fall into that, you lose the dimension of humanity, the dimension that keeps us anchored and recognizing ourselves as stewards of this planet, as, as encouragement to one another, as triggers, sparks to help awaken each other. That's our only purpose on this planet is to awaken ourselves and to awaken others so that we can be the stewards that the Creator intended us to be. I think again it's it's where people let emotion carry them and this is the most destructive thing we can do is the emotion if it carries you, if it drives you, if it is the thing that you believe you are it's totally destructive. I mean emotion is, is given to us uh, to help us as a as a reminder, if you will. So when you're feeling that anger, when you're feeling that frustration, it's telling you something. But what it's not telling you to do is to act out. It's telling you to rethink, to reanalyze, to relook at what is happening around you. But when we approach things always from the point of controversy, I mean, I always step into my adversary, mm -hmm. not in a, in a fight, but in a desire to learn. I want to know why they believe what they believe. Because I don't, very rarely do people just come to some conclusion arbitrarily and just start doing it. They have a logical reason for getting there. Most people function this way. If you can determine what that is, it'll do one of two things. Either it'll change what you believe, and you have to be open to that, or you'll find out what gaps in information they actually have, and then you can provide that information in a rational and reasonable way. And that can create a dialogue. And when the emotion rises, it's time to say, hey, why don't we break this off for a little while? <laughs> it's as simple as that, because nothing will be productive at that point. I mean, I get in debates with PhDs, all right? And when they get to this level where it's all emotion, I say, all right, guys, you know, you're all highly educated, but now we're beyond the point of rational, and now we're just reacting. I said, we're not having any more discussion. We're going to all calm down, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. And let's, let's come back and, and talk about where we're at and why we differ. And that's the nature of true political debate and discourse. It's, it's not just tolerating the idea of a, someone's negative opinion, but it's <laughs> embracing their right to have it. 
Embracing the right of another soul to have a differing opinion is the recognition of yourself as well, because that's your expectation of them. So, in fairness, I think the, the approach is, when the emotions are too high, withdraw, allow that to calm. And, and this is again why learning to control your emotion is such a critical element. I'm teaching my, my 10-year-old this, mm -hmm. and this is something um, I had to learn in my 50s, all right, at, at a level where I feel very competent in this at this point. But, you know, it's an evolution. Life is an evolution uh, internally, you know, and I'm not talking about revolution in, in a biblical sense. I'm talking about internal change. The word revolution comes from the word evolution, revolve, to change not to just keep cycling through the same events. And, and really, that's, that's what all this is really about. And the, the simplest part of it is, it's as simple as a choice. There's some things we can't control. They're happening all the time around us. Do the things you can control. That gives you a sense of controlling your life again. Stepping into what you believe, acting on what you believe, returns the power to you that everyone is taking from you. And I think that's really the approach. I mean, it's, it's not just accepting what someone else is saying as true. It's accepting the fact they have the right to believe also. And this is, in my family, it's really diverse. I've got Republicans, I've got Democrats, Libertarians, Independents. We get together, and we have the liveliest, most intense debates. In fact, if you're on the outside looking in, you'd swear we're about to go to blows. <laughs> but we never do. And it never goes that way. And we always leave embracing each other. And if any of us is in trouble, we are all there. Because fundamentally what we recognize within our family is the right to debate, to disclose, to discuss, recognizing some things we may never agree on. But as human beings and as family, we love each other. Right. And this is what we have to remember, is let's live this exciting debate. Let's experience that exciting debate. But let's underlie that debate with the recognition of our humanity. And even if the other guy forgets it, if you hold that humanity, it is really difficult for them to hold that anger. It is. Because they it can't... They're not getting any feedback, anger no feedback. feedback. Right. And if you don't provide the feedback, it will dissipate. Mm -hmm. Do the opposite. Embrace the adversary. You might change them. Fundamentally, change them. And that's where it is. That's why I always go to my adversary, or what's perceived an adversary. And I don't go in with the idea that I have all the answers. I go in with the idea that I am ignorant, that there's something this person knows that I do not know that has led them to their conclusion. And by not being so focused on my arguments, I'm listening again, approaching the conversation from that curious point of why would a person think that way? Draw that information out. It will help you form up your own arguments or discover you're wrong. And then you have to do the next thing, admit it. Learn from that and move forward. And don't embrace your ideas as if they're the only ones. You know, every major idea in science about every 50 years gets thrown out. And it's happened all the time. And yet science is looked at as almost a religion of concrete ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, they're only concrete for a generation. And then we evolve beyond them, we learn beyond them. And, and that's really what all of life learning is. It's an evolution interiorly, so that we can reflect exteriorly the world we want to create. That's why it has to begin inside, and it has to be reflected spiritually inside in order to have any effect on the outside. In fact, physics tells us that the observer, you and me, mm -hmm. when we look at an object, we determine whether it's a particle or a wave, whether it's energy or solid. That's what physics says. Quantum physics tells us this. This is science. It's, it's science that we accept and know now as something that God was trying to tell us through messengers for eternity. You know, the idea that we create with the Creator, the reality that we engage. And it starts because we have to engage physically, we have to engage emotionally, but most importantly, we have to engage our root, which is the spirit of who we are, the essence of who we are. And put that essence into our life every morning as we wake up and rise into the day we should recognize that the darkness that just left us and the light that appears is a reminder every day that the darkness in our lives disappears. It does cycle, but it disappears. Be the light. Remember it even in the dark places. You remember the story of walking through the valley of the shadow of death and you could see no evil? And the reason was because you only could see the light and you never walk alone. 
And that's what we have to recognize. We walk together, we walk with God, and God walks with us. We're a microcosm of this entire creation. That's how we're created in the image of the Creator. We are part of, we are, we are that. And in this small focal point we call our body, our carriers, we can express that through the soul that we are. And we can connect to the souls that live around us and everyone we touch with our voice, with our thoughts, with our words, and with what we do. Actually, uh, it is. In fact, in Cyprus, they just, just in the last few days made it um, illegal in uh, kindergarten, uh, elementary schools to have these uh, Wi-Fi systems. Uh, Germany has restrictions on um, having them within educational facilities. In Great Britain, uh, they recommend that kids under 16 don't use cell phones, as an example. I wrote the first article on uh, cell phone safety in uh, 1999. It was, it was put in Explore magazine, which is a, a pretty well-known alternative science magazine in the, in the U.S. Um, these are old issues. The, the more, uh, and when you think about uh, RF, radio frequency energy around us, there is, um, as of 2000 anyway, there was 200 million times more RF energy around us than nature creates. Now that happened within 100 years. And you can probably double or triple that now because of how we've expanded, um, expanded this. Now all that energy, the way you feel it, uh, you don't really notice it when you're in it. It's like being in a, in a crowded room with a lot of noise. You filter out all the noise and you have the conversation. We are doing the same thing with the energy around us. And I'll tell you when you notice it when you'll really notice it. When the power fails, and everybody, first thing they say is how quiet it is, because the refrigerators aren't running and motors aren't running. But if you stop for a moment, the next thing is, it's almost like an exhale of your whole body. Because all the time, your body is compensating. And every square inch of the outer surface of the skin are 20,000 sensors. So you're sensing all this on some level, compensating for it, which keeps you in a state of constant stress, underlying stress and agitation. Again, not allowing you to reach higher states of awareness. So things like breathing techniques, things about relaxation techniques, these are designed to sort of break the hold. When the power fails, it breaks the hold. Something simple you can do in your, in your bedrooms at night when you sleep is don't turn the light switches off. Go turn the circuit breaker off to the bedrooms and then use a different kind of alarm clock so you actually get up in the morning and you will sleep more profoundly. Put an electric meter and me measure the voltage on your bed and then kill the breaker and notice the difference. Hmm. These are simple things that can totally give you that little bit of restorative rest you might need by at least eliminating the near field soup that you're in. And the same with your um, Wi-Fi devices. You shut them off at night. Shut the system down at night so that your body can reconnect with this earth, with the energy that is the earth. The energy that comes from the earth, Schumann's resonance, 7.83 hertz. What is that? Hertz, pulses per second, vibrations per second. That happens to correlate with the very front end of the alpha state, which is sort of the zone for athletes, the zone for intellectual and creative writers. This is our natural state. And around us is 60 hertz, an agitated state, a state of tension because that's our power grid. That's what's all around us all the time. So stopping, kick your shoes off, touch the earth again. What do you do when you get home? You kick your shoes off and you reground. First thing most people do, they got these insulators on their feet all day. Yeah. And here's another example of, you know, the, the really athletic guy who's jogging all the time and then all of a sudden one day he just drops with a heart attack and you go, what the heck happened? They're running in these rubber soled shoes. And as they run under the right atmospheric conditions, they build up a static charge. And they can't discharge that static. So it builds up and interferes with the heart rhythm, and they have a heart attack. Yeah, unexplained situation. How did that happen? That's how it happened. Hmm. So a simple thing a jogger can do, put a metal rivet in the, in the toe of your shoe so that every time you touch the ground with the ball of your foot, you actually make a connection and you ground out the excess energy. It'll also stop the cramping in your calves. Because <laughs> what that is is static charge buildup and it moves the calcium out of the bones into the soft tissue and you get cramping. Take a little magnesium, ground yourself appropriately, cramping won't happen. Real simple stuff. Actually, that's how the name Earth Pulse, my, my website was earthpulse.com. It was, I wanted to develop that shoe. Now there is somebody out there that has it now. There are some companies selling these, uh, what they call Earth shoes. Mm -hmm. and. The same is true when you work in, I worked in, uh, in Louisville, Texas, not too far north of here, and um, 
We worked in anti-static environments where you had these cuffs on and they went into ground, uh, ground so they'd kick the statics off you so when you're touching microcircuits you're not blowing them. Right. Well think about that as a human body. You're a bunch of microcircuits, only they're organic. You're blowing your circuits, mm -hmm. you know, by not grounding that excess energy. And this is an important, simple thing. I mean, there's other technologies out there that, that address this. But again, it's sort of on the edge of a lot of the science. You'd have to get into the biophysics side. And this is one of the, one of the fallacies in medicine, okay? P there are very brilliant people in medicine. I know many of them around the world. And they had real strong interest in, say, the chemistry. So they kind of went into the medicine, but they're a little weak on the math. And so they avoided the physics. So what you have is two, a split. You have those with a chemical model for the human body, and you have those with an energetic model, the physicists, the biophysicists. Well, biophysics is the root of the chemical reactions that these guys think you are. <laughs> You're the energy reactions that fuel the chemical reactions that make you who you are. You cannot look at it in isolation. You need to look at both. The biophysicist does. They're very, very brilliant. I, I had the opportunity of working with Alexander K. Varanen, who was the former head of the biophysics lab for the USSR Academy of Sciences. This guy, one of the most brilliant biophysicists on the planet, recognized by Cornell here in the United States, a number of other universities um, have his work cataloged. Go look it up. It will blow your mind. What they have at Cornell under Alexander K. Varanen are a series of papers on what the Bible refers to as the gifts of the spirit, what we used to call extrasensory perceptions, what the military now calls anomalous human potentials. You know, telepathy, telekinesis, these kinds of things. The formulas, the physics of that is explained in those Cornell papers. Alexander K. Varanen worked out the math. If that math gets overlaid with the right engineering, we will see some real transformation on this planet. But all of us already have those latent capabilities. These are what can rise in us if we recognize that Holy Spirit that people talk about in some abstract way, that's the unifying energy I'm talking about right now. Recognizing it, understanding it, and allowing it to, to work in our lives changes us. I mean, as we're talking here, I, c I can feel it in my body. I mean, I can feel it in my hands. Some people can actually see this uh, energy on people. And people go, how do you do that? Well, if you actually measured the fields, you could actually measure all of that. And the further you get, they, the fields change, the density of energy changes. But it's absolutely perceptible. And again, sort of coming back to our root of awareness, our paying attention, a simple thing, was the most important thing, pay attention. Not just to this, but everything around you. And as you're paying attention to everything around you, you're not lost in your thoughts. Your awareness is propelling your words. So they're not pre-thought, they just flow, because that's what's supposed to happen. Well, in, in all of this, the one thing I would say is encourage each other, don't give up, don't succumb to fear, it is the adversary. Recognize that under all of this is a, a love, a consideration, an empathy that we can share. And in that brings back our humanity. Connect with someone every day, connect with them, look them in the eye. Don't look at the reflection of yourself in their eye. Look deep into their eyes and see them as human souls again. Then we're reconnecting. Then the evolution. Then the revolution begins.